Hello and welcome to my channel. My name is Zess and I make Rampai mini game tutorials. And as always, I would like to thank all of my patrons for supporting my channel and my work. It is very helpful, so thank you so much. In this tutorial, I'll show you how to create a simple but classic memory card minigame where the goal is to match all the cards on the screen. Each card has two sides, where one side have an image that needs to be matched with another. When the player clicks on one of the cards, the image side will be revealed with a transition and then the game will wait until the player picks a second one. Once two cards have been revealed and they match, they will be removed from the game. If they don't match, however, the image size of the cards will hide and the player can try again. This minigame will not feature any time limit or score, but it shouldn't be too difficult to implement yourself if it's something you would like. Before we get started, you're going to need a fresh Rampart project in the size 1920 x 1080 pixels using the latest version of the Rampart engine. You're also going to need to download the image assets from the description box below and put them into the images folder of your project. We're going to be working with some Python code in this tutorial, so it's good if you have at least some basic knowledge in Python programming, but if you don't, you might still find it interesting and useful either way. The complete script for this tutorial can also be downloaded by patrons in the tier supporter or higher. With that said, let's go ahead and have a look at the code for this minigame. Here I have the Vampire project for the minigame open in the Atom editor, and the first thing we'll have a look at are some global variables that are needed for the minigame's functionality. These are defined at the bottom of the script, just above the start label, using the default statement. The first variable is called card amount. In this variable, you want to set to the amount of cards you want to have in the minigame. It will be used in a custom function we'll create later to randomly generate the correct amount of images for the cards. The next variable is called card rows, and here you want to set the amount of rows that the cards should be placed in. To make each row evenly filled, you want to make sure that the card amount value can be cleanly divided by card rows, meaning you get a whole number as the resulting value from the division. In this case, I have set the card amount to 12 and the rows to 3. And if we divide 12 by 3, we get 4, which means we will have 3 rows with 4 cards each. Then we have a list variable called cards that will be filled later on with randomly picked card images using a custom function. This list we will then use in our minigame screen in a full loop to add each of the images automatically. We also have another list variable called selected cards which will help us to keep a track of which cards have been selected by the player. This list will then be used to see if the player selected a matching pair of cards or not. The hidden cards variable will keep a track of how many cards have been hidden as a result of matches being found. So each time a matching pair has been selected by the player, we will add two to this variable as two cards will not be hidden. Then later on, we can compare to see if this variable is equal to the amount of cards we had available at the start of the game. If they are, then that means that all cards have been matched and we can then do an appropriate action. The last variable is called match found and is a boolean variable that will be set to true or false depending on if a match was found or not. This variable can then be used to determine the next action that should occur depending on the result. Now if we have a look at the start label, we can see that we are calling a function named randomized cards. This function is responsible for generating the random images for the cards to use and should always be called before you show the minigame screen. And in this case, this screen is called memory minigame. So at any point in your game, when you want to show the minigame to the player, you want to make sure you do it in this order. Let's have a look at this randomized cards function next. So here we have the randomized cards function, which we have inside of an init python block. As I mentioned before, this function generates a random list of image names to use for the cards. We do that by using a for loop that runs card amount times, which is 12 in this case, divided by 2. And we divide the amount by 2 because we are going to be creating two cards in each iteration to make a pair. And because 6 times 2 is 12, we are going to end up with 12 cards in total. Inside the for loop, we have a local variable called randcardnum, which we set to a random number between 1 and 8. That's because in our images folder, we have 8 different card images we can use. And to generate the random number, we use rampice brand int function. We then use string interpolation to build the name of the image we want to add to the list. Because we need a few details about the card in question, such as if it's currently selected by the user, and if it's visible or not, 
we're adding the image and these other details into another list. Then we simply add this list as an item to the cards list. We do this two times to create a pair of matching cards for every iteration of the loop. Once the for loop has finished, we then shuffle the cards list using the shuffle function also available in RenPy. This makes sure that all the items in the list have a random order, otherwise we'll have each pair in the list beside each other in the game, and that would just make the game way too easy to play. Now, if you want to let your player be able to play the game again after they have finished matching all the cards, you're going to want to empty the cards list first so you can generate a fresh new list when the game starts over. For that, we make sure that every time this function runs, we set the cards list to an empty list, otherwise the list would just keep getting more cards. For that, we need to first specify that the cards variable is a global variable by using the global keyword together with the variable's name. So now that we know how this function works, let's have a look at the minigame screen called Memory Minigame. In here we first of all have a background image which just depicts a wooden tabletop, then we have a grid displayable. We set the amount of columns to be card amount divided by card rows because this will again give us the amount of cards that each row should have. Then we have the amount of rows which we set to the value of card rows. The reason we use these variables instead of specifying directly the values that we want is because if you change your mind at any point and want more or less cards, you just need to change the values of these variables where they are defined. This way you don't need to go through everywhere in the script to find and replace the values where they are needed. It just gives you a little less work to do and makes it less likely that you will get errors because you forgot to change the value somewhere. Next we set the grid's placement in the game and the amount of spacing that there should be between each card. Now to add the cards to this grid, we can simply loop through the cards list and check each card's details to determine which kind of displayable we want to use. To create the loop, we add two variables for it to use. The first one, called i, will contain a number representing the current iteration of the loop, and it will start at zero. The second variable will hold the current item in the cards list, which as you may remember, will be another list with all the details of the card in question. Inside the for loop, we can now check if the current card in the loop is deselected and visible. We do that by comparing if the second value in the list, which has the index value of 1, is equal to deselected. Then we also check if the third value in the list, which resides at index value 2, is equal to visible. And if this whole if statement is true, then we know that this specific card is supposed to be showing the backside because it has not yet been selected. For that we can use an image button, the spable, to allow the user to interact with it. We don't have a hover version of the backside of the card, so we just specify the add -all image. We also use the sensitive property to make sure that the player can only click on a card as long as two cards has not yet been selected. Because once two cards have been selected, we want to have a bit of a delay where the player can see what the cards are. And during this delay, we don't want the player to be able to keep clicking and revealing other cards. So for that, we check if the length of the selected cards list is not equal to two. And if that is true, then this image button will be sensitive. But if it's equal to 2 instead, then we make this button insensitive. Then we add an action that should run when the player clicks on this card, which is a function call to a function named select card and is defined in the initPython block. We supply this function with a parameter we call card index and should contain the index value of the current iteration of the loop. This will then help us to identify which card the player has selected. Let's have a look at this function next. So here we have the select card function, and this function is responsible for changing the details of a card in question so that it is set to selected rather than deselected. We do that by selecting the correct item from the cards list by using the card index parameter. After we have the correct card, we then want to grab the value which represents whether or not the card is selected or not. This value is stored at the index position 1, so we add 1 instead of these two square brackets. Then we want to change this value to selected, so we say is equal to selected. Then we also want to add this card into the selected cards list, so we add its index value by referring to the card index parameter. Because this function will run every time the player clicks to reveal a card, we take the opportunity to check if two cards have now been selected and if these two match. We do that by creating an if statement that checks if the selected cards list has two items in it and if these share the same image. If that is true, then we set the match found variable to true. Now because we changed the values for the selected cards and match found variables, we need to specify their global variables 
So we use the global keyword together with the variables names at the top of the function. Now let's go back to the memory minigame screen. For the image button we had a look at earlier, we also apply a transform called card fade in, which simply makes sure the card fades in when it's first shown. This is done by setting the alpha property to zero to start with, and then set it to animate to full opacity for 0.5 seconds. Now we also need a displayable that will represent a card that has been flipped over to reveal its image. For that we have an elif statement underneath, right here, that checks if the current card in the loop happens to be selected and visible. If it is, then we instead set the displayable to be a normal image that can't be clicked on. We then use string interpolation to pick the correct image to use from the images folder. To do that, we grab the correct name of the card by accessing the first value of the item in the list. We then also set this image to use the card fit in transform so it will fade in when it's first shown. Then we have an else statement that will run its code in case neither of the if statements above are true. In this case, it would mean that this particular card in the current iteration of the loop isn't visible but hidden because it has been matched with another card. For that, we add a null displayable to emulate an empty space in the grid. If we don't add any displayable at all, then we will get an error message that says that the grid is not completely full. Now to make sure the player has time to observe what the images are that they have flipped over, we use a timer that will run an action after so many seconds has passed. This action will run another function called hide matches or deselect cards depending on whether or not a match was found. To check if a match was found, we use the match found variable in an if statement to see if it is true or false. If it is true, then this timer will be used, which will wait for one second before it calls the hide matches function. We also have to set the timer to continuously repeat in order to work properly. Let's have a look at the hide matches function next. Here we have the hide matches function, which is inside of the init Python block. In here, we make sure we set both of the selected cards to be hidden instead of visible, as the player successfully found a match. We do that by grabbing both of the cards from the cards list by referring to the index values of them stored in the selected cards list. Then we set the cards to be hidden instead of visible. Now that we have set two cards to be hidden, we add two to the hidden cards variable. We then run a function called deselect cards and then also set the match found variable to false. The deselect cards function simply makes sure that two cards that have been selected are deselected. We do that by first checking if the select cards list have two items in it, and if it has, we run a for loop that will go through each item in the cards list. Then we check if the current card in the loop is selected, and if it is, we set it to deselected instead. Then when the loop is finished, we set the selected cards list to empty again so the player can select two new cards. If we now go back to the memory minigame screen again, we can see that in the next elif statement, we're checking if the selected cards list have two items in it. If this elif statement is true, then that means that there were two cards selected, but they didn't match. In that case, we just want to deselect these cards, so we run the function deselect cards that we just had a look at. The last elif statement checks if the hidden cards variable is equal to the card amount variable. Because if they are, then that means that all cards have been matched, and as such we can create new cards to fill the screen with. For that, we create a timer again that will run 0.5 seconds after this condition becoming true. In this case, we run another function called reset memory game, which will help us to reset the game so the player can play it again. This one does not need to be repeating, so we set the repeat property to false. Now let's have a look at the reset memory game function. This function is pretty simple, as we just reset the match found variable back to false and set the hidden cards variable to zero. As always, since we changed the values for these variables, we need to declare them as global, which we do at the top of the function. We then lastly run the randomized cards function to generate new cards. If we now go back to the memory minigame screen, we can see a section that I have commented out down here. These are just two simple buttons I made as an example to show how you could let the user control when they should reset the game or quit it, rather than using a timer for it. The first button simply runs the reset function when pressed, and the second one allows the player to quit the game. You of course want to add an appropriate action here, such as jump, for example, to jump to a label that continues the normal flow of your visual novel. I just put a null action here as I don't have anything specific to jump to for this tutorial. 
But that's about it for the minigame script. If you have any questions about the code or run into problems with it, feel free to leave a comment down below and I'll see if I can help out. And if you liked this video, I would appreciate if you pressed the like button and left a comment down below to let me know. If you're interested in supporting my channel to keep it going, I have a Patreon page with different tiers that have different benefits that might be interesting to you. In the supporter tier or higher, you also get access to all my previous scripts from previous tutorials and also some extra scripts as well. If you're looking for GUI graphics for your visual novels made with Rempai, I also have a few paid ones on my itch.io page in different styles that might be interesting. And buying any of those also helps to support my work. And as always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next video.